Adam Schraff, resident. Marcus Steeler from Harmony on LLP. Rachel Tan from White Sea, Los Angeles. Kelly Marie from Los Angeles. Lisa Ivan AGG. Terry Tony Selling on the show and Sherry and Martin. Bob Betty, Andrew Thomas, California Downtown Association. Victor Gonzalez, Director of Operations for South Park Pit. Daryl Holter, uh, we own Petroleum Building. Founding chairman of the Figueroa Reporter Business Improvement District from 21 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Anne Hawthorne, Urban Foundation in Kid City. David Aguilar, Operations Manager with uh, South Park, oversee our service team. Angela De Los Santos, Homeless Outreach Coordinator. Okay. Oh, wow. Just join us. Rich, you want to quickly introduce yourself? Rich Wu, one of the directors uh, with South Park Fit. Um, Resident owner here in the South. You staged that entrance? Very fast. Sure, yeah. <laughs> so, welcome. Uh, thanks to everyone for being here. I'm going to open it up to public comments and announcements. And I know that we have one special announcement from Anne. And I'm going to turn it over to you. Hi, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I want to, first of all, thank the South Park Bid. Um, they have been, you guys have been so supportive of all our events and on requests. Um, I'm representing the Urban Foundation. We're, um, we have our office in the Petroleum Building and we run a youth leadership and college access program right here on Hope up on the next block called Kid City. And the Assemblyman's Office has also been um, just a great support, so thank you. Um, I'm here just to invite you to two upcoming events. One is on August 10th, it's our Splash of LA. You know, I've been here every year to invite you all um, to support, we're looking for sponsors. This year, for the first time, we're gonna have the event in the, I think we're, it's, you know, 95% sure we're gonna move from our parking lot, um, which is hot, as you can imagine, <laughs> into the Fidham uh, Grand Hill Park. So I'm really excited. It's a very kind of homegrown neighborhood event. We have lots of games and activities for children. It's free. Um, the, it's completely organized by our high school and college students. So it has just a, a really lovely family-like atmosphere. We sell really good tacos and homemade food. Um, it's from 12 to 4 on August 10th. So I have um, sponsorship packets here. It's just a very low, um, we asked for a very low contribution of $250 to $500 to sponsor the event. And um, I want to thank 1010 Development is always a sponsor. And um, we've just had uh, great support from the community. So please um, get out the word. Lulu was kind enough to make some flyers for us um, to save the date on August 10th. It's August 10th in the afternoon at Grand Hill Park. And we also, I don't have any um, flyers yet, but we also are having an open house at Kid City on July 31st in the evening. And if you'd like to come, if any of you have children or um, teenagers or college students or if you'd like to come and volunteer, we'd really love to have you. I, I just, it's a really a jewel of a little program here in South Park. And, um, you know, with all the difficulties and conflicts and the, the homeless and the housing shortage, um, if you want just a little spot that will lift your spirits and give you something positive to reflect on, just come by and stop by our program. So that's all. Thank you so much for giving me the time. Thank you. And if you want to leave several copies of the sponsorship mm -hmm. packet, we'll uh, make sure they get certified. I will do. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Um, any other public comments or announcements? I have an announcement, um, which I'm very thrilled to share with everyone. Uh, I want to welcome Victor Gonzalez to uh, the South Park Bid staff. Um, Victor. Has 
just been extraordinary, and I couldn't be more happy to welcome him officially as a good staff person. So, uh, Victor's our director of operations. He can be reached at Victor at uh, SouthPark.LA. I'm just going to blast out your, your email address. <laughs> Thank you.
but it's not an apples to apples in terms of um, it's a flat increase of five percent across the board. But how we calculate assessments varies. Um, on the expense <laughs> side, uh, some of these kids are just the vendors. Have we got projections from them? Or is there on some for our vendor contracts, that's something that I've worked out ahead of time with one by one. Um, and then these numbers here are estimates based on our spending in the past and where we see next year's expenses going. Yes, yeah, so we looked at the average of year to date for the first five months and then projected that through December. But then we went through line item, each line item to see if some particular expenses we may have incurred in full years. Um, amount already, or we haven't incurred any, and we know it's going to be later. So it's it's very accurate, at least for this point. As accurate as any pro forma can be. Sure. So I also want to clarify that we're not. This vote is not to approve this budget. We're still quite early in the year to solidify what next year's budget is going to be. It's a very accurate, I think, pretty accurate or as accurate as it is going to be projection of what 2020 is going to look like. But that budget isn't going to be put forward the board until later this year when we have those numbers you know, more solidly worked out. This is just for the this, this is just for assessment. So you want to take your vote today on the right. Correct. Uh, on the increase, so yes, potential I've always felt the South Park did as a fantastic job by badly needed services to the entire neighborhood and community. And the more we are able we are able to provide funding for that, we only have a outside the attack on this country. So I'm in favor of funds. Well, what's the history of the last five years in terms of increases? So we raised last year for the first time in four years. We haven't raised prior to that in quite some time. The board is um, allowed to, per our manual district plan, which is our contract with the city, the board is allowed to increase assessments on an annual basis up to 5%. Um, we had a conversation last year when we made this about 5% um, about what that methodology should look like, considering that the board didn't decide to increase for a few years prior. And there's varying philosophies on, on the, how to approach that, right? Some bids say every year we're just going to do a consistent increase of 3 or 4%. Um, I think it was the conversation that we had last year was really about, well, we haven't done it in several years, and so we're going to be more aggressive with these especially since our algorithms right now are not uh, reflecting the density, which is a conversation we've all had um, in meetings past. We are not able to uh, adjust that algorithm without a rewrite of our management district plan, which essentially means we have to recontract with the city. So normally, bids wait to renew. We, you know, bids will wait for a renewal before adjusting that algorithm, uh, which our renewal, you know, we're in the middle of a five-year life cycle in our contract with the city. We'll be up again in 2023. Um, so we'll start that renewal process in 2021. It usually takes about a year and a half to go through that process. Um, at that point, we will be making some decisions about what that algorithm looks like. Or, you know, th there is another option, which is that we um, do that, we make those decisions sooner. That means essentially triggering the renewal process earlier than our contract. One more question. What, do we have an idea of <laughs> the square footage of properties coming online in 2020 that will increase our budget? Yes. We Is do. that in here? I did. Yep. So um, the assessment out. revenue for which you see where uh, the orange right. line here says include C of O's. I can provide breakout if you're interested in seeing what those um, new properties are going to be. I can share that information. I think it's about five or six new properties that are going to be coming online at some point in, in 2020. Um, and what are they assessing when they come online? They follow the same algorithm. It's about $95,000 is what it's going to be totaling. That's right, right? Marcus, 95. Yes, 95. Um, so on the new property opening up in June now, if I'm opening it up in July, I will be assessed 95000 No, sorry. Um, uh, total. I've, I've summed up all of the CFOs, all of these new assessments, uh, and that totals about five hundred thousand. It also depends, I think, on 
what the building owner wants to do. Are they going to keep it under one assessment number? Or are they going to keep it under multiple assessment numbers? Yes. Yeah, the, the, if they keep it under one, are we're only showing on linear feet. Correct. No. We assess based on three factors. So one is linear feet, and that's the most expensive um, of the three factors. It's anywhere between eleven and fifteen dollars, I think, based on what's on the rent per per foot. The other factor is uh, building square footage, and that's the, that density number that we're talking about, which is really low. That rate is really, really low. Um, and the third factor is lot size, lot square footage. So that's just the footprint of the space, regardless of. I'll get the education today. We don't we don't assess each individual condominium unit by the size of the condominium unit. So condos are a little different. Condos are a flat rate of thirty three cents per square foot. Thirty three cents per per condo unit. Thirty three cents per square foot per condo unit. Okay. So every condo owner is uh, is technically assessed. a different owner yeah. and they are assessed. Okay. So is the number, so the question I've got is, is that a material number between keeping it as an income, as an apartment with one APN number, or is it a different number when you have 300 APN numbers? Yeah, it's a hugely different number. That's, we, I we look have, at the markets for that. I don't actually get involved in the assessment methodology, so. I can speak to that a little bit. Okay. We've had a, we had an experience um, two years ago when we were going through the renewal process where we had an apartment building that was tracked for condos. And so because they were renting, the owner of the building assumed the assessments, right, which was massive compared to what they would be paying if it were tracked for an apartment, as an apartment building. Um, and there was a whole back and forth, and, and it was a technicality, but, um, but you know, it is what it is. Okay. All I want yeah, it is, it is a pretty significant difference. That's why I think perhaps we should put on the agenda a discussion to move up the time frame for changing the formula so that we are accounting for density and water requirements. <coughs> sure. I mean, I, we can include that conversation on a future agenda. It won't affect sure. this, I understand. We need to decide this now, but perhaps we should move up the time frame. So Eric, today's goal is to improve to increase or not increase? Correct. And yeah. by how much? Let me ask you a two-part question. Could we could we um, decide to uh, do staged increases, say three percent for the next three years? Um, could we do that at basically one a year? And then if we did that, Services that everybody can see. 
I don't think that's what we're talking about here. We just want to talk about this year for some increase or no increase. And then we revisit it next year. And maybe next year we see that we have, we're doing okay at whatever we do this year. And we can run it through for next year, or we can go for a lower number. So in my mind, from my perspective as a property owner, um, obviously I favor no increase. <laughs> Shocking. <laughs> Just putting it out there. Um, I know zero percent from what I'm hearing is off the table. Okay. Um, we, we need to increase this year. I guess conceptually, if you can explain to the board, maybe, maybe it's just me. If there are more properties coming up online, why the need? And I'm not doubting it, but just it, it you know, maybe not by my head, but maybe conceptually explain to, to the board or myself why the need to increase five or why the preference to increase you know as much as five. The the properties that are coming online are not making up the difference. Or the properties that are coming online, by the way, the assessments and the revenue generated by those properties are all reflected in, in these um, analyses. Right, so it's the orange line, right? See above? Uh, it's built into the orange line. It has not been broken out. The line item itself is ninety five thousand dollars. So <laughs> imagine broken out ninety five thousand dollars. And by the way that is some of those funds are coming in August of next year, is the assumption. Okay. Um, but first of all, cost of living is going up, as we've all said. Um, our contracts has changed, from, our vendor contracts has changed, and minimum wage is going up. And so we like to maintain a competitive, I mean, our ambassadors are making more than um, minimum wage, but we like to maintain a competitive yeah, advantage there. Um, we made some changes internally in terms of uh, uh, staff pay, and so those are reflected in this new budget, um, which I am hesitant to use those terms because it's not finalized, right? But the sure. projections for what we are uh, looking at for 2020. Um, so then that's fine. I, I, feel, I mean, I, I think that's want, sufficient. I want, I want. Would it be a safe assumption to say that <clears throat> Clean and safe needs to stay where it is or move up because there is virtually no support from the city. Yes. Oh, and you can so agree. So, so, I mean, if you were looking to keep it at zero and you look to cut clean and safe, where what are we doing to the stakeholders within South Park? Because I think it's a safe assumption to say that we are getting zero support from the city of Los Angeles. Yeah, I think we can all agree that. So, I guess. I think, thank you for your answer. I think moving forward then, um, kind of piggybacking on what Patrick was saying, is there any guidance, again, I know we have to do this every year, but guidance from you, Bob, Marcus, next year, what do you think the number will be, if there's an increase? Zero, three, five. way to introduce 
our services uh, and access and organization our programming to people that were not paying attention before. Um, you know, I did have a few people who were saying, hey, you want me to increase, but I don't see you guys power washing. Right? So then it opened up that conversation and it's okay, uh, let me tell you a little bit more about our services and what we do. Um, but I, I did not have anybody who said, no, I am not. Is there a plan increase in minimum wage that will affect the 2021 cost of the uh, Yeah. Okay. So we'll be facing the same issue again. And also the contracts that we formed with block by block was a two year contract. So we will renegotiate that contract. So another reason I just think that getting us on track to a plan that increases density sooner rather than later will alleviate a lot of this because it will make our budget a bit more sensible with the neighborhood. You know, people see all these big buildings and think, wait a minute, there's a new big building, why is it? Why do we need more money? But that size of that big apartment building isn't changing our budget very much. It, well, it also increases the need for services to become right. more people. Much That's more than what we're getting from it because if it's not condos, it's not going to be effective. I felt that block by block was able to address that question much better for street plus one. We were telling I was talking to street plus a lot. We have all this coming in. How are you going to change your budget? And I just never felt we got a straight answer from them. We'll probably find out, you know, in a, in a year or so if block by block is thinking that way and if they're going to get to the answer, I don't know. Terry, I've noted your request to include that on the research agenda and I will We just can't have a vote. No, no, I just have to say that I think that we help a lot of the questions that people are getting as far as what happens actually in your office. Um, so, so Patrick, your initial question was can we, can the board decide to lock us into a plan for a future increase? I think what makes more sense is that the board can informally decide but that we, we, we revisit this conversation every year, which is something we have to do anyway because we have to submit our uh, we have to submit it to the city on an annual basis. Um, even if there's no change. <laughs> yeah, even if we have to tell them an answer one way or another. Um, so we'll have this conversation again. But if you as a board want in this moment to say, you know, I think we should come up with a, long, a longer term strategy for the, um, you know, for, the, for the next three years, which is the life cycle of our current contracts, sure. I would just encourage you to then revisit that, you know, when the time comes next year. Yeah, it's not even What's the renewal cycle for It's every five years. So we renewed in 18, right. it brings us through 2022, 2023 through whatever that is, 27, I think. Can we go longer? So yeah, the next. We go 10 years. We can go seven, years. Yeah. we can go seven. And the there's are things are still changing as yeah. the neighborhood continues to evolve. Yeah. Well, that's the gift. We could. I understood that. Yeah. Well, I just want to make sure we capture the renewal opportunity. Right. Oh, we capture it. Yeah, we have. Because otherwise, we get zero. Right. I believe that we should visit this year to year. I don't believe it's in our best interest to go three years out due right. to. We don't know what the city of Los Angeles is going to do as it relates to any services in and around South Park or in and around the entire city. And second, I, I wouldn't want to be hamstrung to state that, all right, we said 333 three, three or 444, four, and then the city does what they normally do, which is. <laughs> so without, without further dialogue, I would move to approve. Uh,
unless we have this other, we'll have a future conversation about um, whether or not it's wise to move up that rule. Date. And frankly, I need to do a bit of homework to look at our contract with the city to see what that looks like if we do decide we want to um, amend it or, or, you know, what that means from a technical perspective. I have some time. Um, not so much for the methodology. I need to. I need to understand: Are we breaking our contract with the city if we decide to do that? Um, because we technically, you are not allowed to adjust your methodology for assessment collection, i.e., those those rates, those algorithm rates, right? Okay. Um, until your oh, yeah. Or is it uh, an amendment to your MDP, your management district plan? And I don't know if you're allowed to do that. So I need. I need to do some research. And really understand sort of those things that are Are you saying to, to look at that methodology for the next renewal in three years or earlier? Uh, I'm saying we certainly have to do it. We're absolutely doing it for three years. I question whether we should be doing it sooner than that. Well, I don't think it's sooner than that. I think we should be doing it sooner than that. Because it's not going to be a Board members, this was included in your packets. I'm going to 
briefly read the summary so we're all on the same page. This is a bill introduced by Assembly Member Santiago. AB 1197 responds to the homeless crisis in Los Angeles by exempting from CEQA funding and related planning decisions for supported housing projects funded by Measure HHH. And Virginia, yes, we don't have a um, This was in your digital copy. Oh, 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 yes, I'm sorry. It was out for everyone. Essentially, this says any uh, proposal for supportive housing um, or shelter housing um, is is uh, is not subject to CEQA. So what's been happening is that um, there have been proposals made and they've been held up because people are using CEQA to uh, get them to not be built. For all the developers in the room, that's um, unfortunately not an unfamiliar uh, play that way. So this bill says um, any of that of those housing uh, proposals will not be subject to CEQA. Um, I included it on our agenda to give the board an opportunity to decide whether we want to um, attach a letter to this, um, a letter of support, or not. Um, my recommendation is that we submit and I know that we have Lizeth here too, if, from uh, assembly members on the other's office here, so if there's anything that I misspoke about, Lizeth, please chime in.
It doesn't it, affect it, it doesn't affect the process of identifying the location at all. That that's going to continue as it is. Uh, a bridge home, which is Garcetti's initiative um, to speed along the shelter development, is it allows cities to use their property for emergency emergency shelters. Without having to go through sequel. Right. Right. Why is this charge? Well, I just wonder if you're Support of this would be contingent on adding in a suggestion that this go beyond. Because I think it's a great suggestion. I was thinking a letter of support is a good idea. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that would be my thing. That would be my thing. That would be the only thing I would say. Otherwise, I think this is a good bid. Yeah. Um, Why aren't there more bids listed here supporting this? It's somewhat new. So uh, I believe other bids and other organizations are going to be sending us this. Okay. It's quite new. So I guess the question I have for you was that. Is that did, did my does this only apply to HHH projects and not all uh, affordable housing projects? Why is it limited to just HHH? Right. So um, I think is uh, thinking and it's still sort of it could be amended, but the thought is we could start somewhere with the Triple H funding, considering in your fact sheet there's a um, summary portion of City of LA has already identified locations that would receive this funding, but they've been kind of. Um, stopped because of the CEQA process. So it's kind of helping in terms of uh, that component. And um, I'm also happy to say that if there are any other specific questions, I'm happy to share those with our legislative director who's handling the bill and our capital team. Um, share those questions with her if we want to get an email together, and I can get more specific responses for those as well. It's also easier. Um, it's easier to do the bill because you've already got something in place, so you're just kind of hanging off. Sure. So my suggestion is, well, you got to Material will rewrite the bill. Yeah, I'm saying you have a bigger issue than just that these HHH units are going to put HHH kind of problems are going to solve. Oh, sure. You have know, a larger approach. Yeah. So again, there's going to be some ramifications to that. But why are we really going to need just these 10,000 or 7,500 units? That's what I'm saying. Yeah. We need to expand that out. Doug, this is the next chart. Oh, yeah. Do you have a question? Um, so I just have a quick question. Um, is this a situation where if you try to expand, what's covered in this bill that now it reduces the probability of it can be passed in a timely manner? Yes. Would it be more advantageous just to take what we have right now and get it passed and then move on to the next piece? Oh, so we can get some progress going? It could. It could. And, but we don't know. You know, I mean, I, we, I can't sit right I don't know what goes on this back. I don't imagine. Yeah, I, I Black think magic. generally that's correct, that, um, that if this board were to say, you have our support, if and only if, um, it's, it's almost like a non-support. Yeah. So could it be, we support this, but we'd also like to see additional yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We, support, we support what you're doing thus far, and that's great. And let's support that, yes. and let's look but at could we support. suggest this add -on? Kind of an addition yeah. to or, instead of a yeah. and or. Kind of. Exactly. Which we, the board can decide to do. <laughs> At this point, any kind of progress is good. Sure. Well, I okay. I I move that we send a letter of support for this bill as written, with additional language to the effect that it could be expanded more because Triple H money is gone. Second. Um, Rich, you seconded. Yes. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any oppositions or uh, abstentions? Okay, so move. So I will draft this and I will dub on. Um, I'll share it with you. Um, and then we'll send that out. Great, thank you. Okay, so we're now at uh, item number eight. Uh, I have invited four representatives from organizations who do advocacy and policy work in Los Angeles um, to come and share with the board specifics about what that work looks like from them. So I'm really pleased, thank you all for uh, joining us today. Um, this is an opportunity for the board to learn more about all of the work. I know that there's a lot of concerns about what we're seeing on the ground and how it's impacting U.S. property owners or its residents here in South Park um, and in the broader downtown region. And so uh, the focus here is an opportunity for you all to understand what that policy and advocacy work is looking like. Um, and if we want to make decisions about 
how the bid supports that work or fills in. Um, we can do that at a subsequent date. But right now, what we're here to, to do is to hear from these folks and what their organizations are working on. Um, we will have time for Q&A, but really this is just a sort of learning opportunity. So first up is Jessica Duboff. Um, Jess comes from uh, the LA Area Chamber of Commerce, um, and I'm going to let her do a bigger introduction uh, and take it away. So Jess, about eight to ten minutes. Usually quicker than that. Great. <laughs> Um, yeah, you can stand, and there's a clicker here for you. I just have a couple of slides. I actually pull these from um, the membership orientation that we do for our members. So these are a little broad, just kind of give you a picture of, of how we do policy in the chamber and how we kind of organize and engage our members. So this is just our general mission to employ business, promote collaboration, and help our members grow. Um, the LA Chamber is actually about 1,600 members, 90% of which are small business, um, as defined by kind of the federal SBA. So we have a lot of large members, but also a lot of middle and small members. Um, this is kind of the makeup of the chamber. We've got six centers. Um, I lead, I'm the vice president of the Center for Business Advocacy. Um, we have a center for small business success, global trade and foreign investment, leadership, innovation, technology, and education excellence and talent about talent development. Um, chamber has about 100 employees, only half of which are in the education um, and workforce space. Um, so that's a huge priority of ours. Filters through all the other work that we do. Um, so serving as a way to business, we have advocacy, our events, outreach, and a coalition building. As the LA Chamber, um, we technically say you know, represent the county of Los Angeles, but so many of the issues that we work on impact the whole Southern California region. So we work very closely with um, partners in Ventura and the Empire Riverside, like, you know, Orange County. <coughs> Um, so how we kind of organize our policy is we have a set of councils. Um, each of these are chaired by board members involved in these spaces. And they, at the beginning of each year, kind of lay out a advocacy agenda that they vote on. Um, these are kind of big factor priorities, which as a staff really enables us to move quickly. We don't have to, every time a piece of legislation or, or an ordinance comes up, we don't have to call a meeting, have a vote. If, if it's all in one of those buckets, by experts in their fields at the beginning of the year, we're able to start engaging really quickly. So education workforce development, um, as I said, that's about half of our staff. Uh, energy, water, and environmental sustainability. These could be regional issues uh, involving CEQA, HMD, um, oil, gas, etc. Government and fiscal affairs. Um, this was started as kind of where we house our work on tax policy, pensions, etc. And we kind of parked cannabis in there once we legal industry, and that's really become um, the majority of the work that they do. Um, there's a lot of cannabis work at the federal, state, and local level that we are just sticking our toe in at the moment. It's, it's still controversial, and so how we kind of handle that was we got um, the Government and Fiscal Affairs Council put together a set of guidelines on how we would activate ourselves in the cannabis space, and those guidelines were approved by the Executive Committee. Um, we did that because we had originally opposed cannabis legalization. So since we didn't, you know, didn't want to stick our heads in the sand, obviously thought it was an important area to plan. Um, we just wanted to make sure we got buy-in across the board. So um, we're trying to do stuff there. Uh, healthcare, innovation, technology. Um, that is actually a partnership with our FIFSL exchange. A couple of years ago, we developed in partnership with the Small Business Administration, our own SBDC. Most SBDCs are geographically based. This was the first one in the region that was focused on a specific industry. So we do a lot of um, technology startup innovation there. Land use, housing, and construction. Um, I think this is where we can have the most overlap with the bid. This is where we house all the work we do with homelessness. Um, about 10, 12 years ago, we started a partnership with the United Way, the Home for Good program, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And our current board chair, Jerry Newman, leads the Business Leaders Task Force. And they really spent a lot of time research on kind of the permanent supportive housing model. Um, so we've done a lot of work there. And then transportation and good movement. Um, we work very closely here with Metro, with the port. Um, we also have a freight task force, which looks at issues ranging from first class mile delivery all the way to you know, moving goods throughout the rest of the country. Um, and so there's some of our additional initiatives. We have a PAC that weighs in on local and county races. Um, we organize three access trips. Um, the first one, Access Washington, D.C. is actually 
much in collaboration with all the other business groups in the region, as well as City Hall and the county. We just take about 160 people to DC in the spring, um, including members of City Council, and advocate on issues important to the region. Um, we used to do this just ourselves, and our commercial representatives were saying, hey, y'all could hear a different message as they on the same So we work really closely again with the mayor's office in the county and other business groups, and those things that we can work together on, we do. Um, Access Sacramento, this just happened in May. We take about 60 to 80 people up in here, and we have a policy agenda, usually about 50 or 60 people, so we can put in a lot of things. Um, LA City Hall is in the fall. This is where we present um, an economic report done by one of our board members who can comments. Um, they do a district by district breakdown on employment numbers, development, permits pulled for housing, etc. And uh, the city council members actually a few times I've seen them pay attention to what it comes on. Um, Accenture campaign through politics. Um, that's kind of a intimate opportunity for our members to interact with um, high-level officials. And then state of infrastructure is a partnership we do in the fall with Siemens. Um, they issue a report every year that they write for us kind of on how LA is progressing on our transportation, energy, broadband, all that sort of infrastructure. And that's for our members, the, the different ways that they can get involved. Um, so I know that was more general, a uh, specific thing that we're working on. But um, I would say you know, kind of our top priorities are kind of the same as what it is to be as housing and homelessness right now. I would say four or five years ago, the homeless piece was on our radar, but housing, you know, for the last two or three years, has been, been our biggest thing. We are. Has the chamber taken a position? something that's important to this board and that is an infrastructure project of uh, putting Pico Station underground and making the Expo and the Blue Lines work much better. We have not taken a position. I urge you to. Okay, we will look into it. Um, as the regional chamber, we don't always get involved in sort of like near specific things like that. It's um, regional. It's regional. Absolutely. But I'd like to say something like that. We could to our to our committee and you know to talk about the regional impacts. Is, yes, this is one station. However, you know it impacts the mobility of the whole system. Absolutely. Are you publicly and privately funded? Is it a quasi funding? No, yeah, we are a nonprofit, private dollars. Um, we are mem membership dues and then sponsorships. And that education and workforce piece, um, they are actually a separate 501c4. My lobbying side is C6, and so they get a lot of Any other questions about the chamber does and how we Great. So we are members of the chamber. It is a member of the chamber. Oh, we are. How much do we need to do? Our annual dues are $6.8. Great. Um, and Jess, actually, that was a question I had for you. Is um, our board members, I assume, are eligible to attend the member specific events and everything? Is that correct? Yeah, sure. Uh, we are a volunteer board 
Uh, we have no paid staff. We do have an agreement with the International Downtown Association, or IDA, probably familiar with them, and they provide us with the uh, uh, internal infrastructure that helps us manage our membership, our website, marketing, communications, and uh, uh, events. Uh, we have 12 members currently on our board. We divide evenly between north and south. Uh, in the south, represented on our board, we have uh, Los Angeles, San Diego, Long Beach, Pasadena, Santa Monica, and Santa Barbara. In the north, we're represented by Oakland, Santa Cruz, San Jose, San Francisco, Sacramento, and Walnut Creek. Most of our board members uh, do work for business improvement districts. We have a couple members that represent cities as well. We have one formerly uh, uh, former member who just left uh, recently was with a consultant. Our primary purpose is to advocate for our downtown communities. And uh, we do this through a lobbyist that we have who's based in Sacramento. And we work to really advocate for legislation that we believe will benefit our business improvement districts and our downtown places. But we also oppose uh, legislation that we feel uh, would be problematic for us. Uh, we also meet locally with our elected officials that uh, each of us in our representative areas uh, have. So I've met with uh, State Senator Van Allen and sometimes with Assembly Member Bloom, really a push for uh, policies and legislation that we feel uh, will benefit our districts. Uh, recent uh, legislation that we've taken positions on, we've been supportive of SB 50, which is the bill that would uh, allow housing density in areas of uh, transportation uh, hubs and job centers. We're supportive of SB 34, which would uh, make unlawful entry into a vehicle uh, if that constitutes a theft, which for some reason it does not now, but uh, uh, that is what it is. Uh, we've opposed bill, we oppose SB 518, which is legislation that would remove uh, what we feel are important tools that would discourage, uh, discourage litigation on matters of the CPRA, and we're also opposed to AB 516, uh, which would eliminate the ability of our local law enforcement to remove vehicles that are illegally parked in a public right of way. We take other positions uh, as well. Um, in addition to uh, promoting advocacy, we also uh, look to uh, provide educational networking opportunities for our members and uh, folks who participate in our organization. Every spring, we host a conference. It's called the West Coast Urban District Forum. Uh, this past year, we held it in the Fashion District bid. We switched between North and South to, uh, to help our members out so they're not traveling every year. Last year, it was in Walnut Creek. Before that, it was in Long Beach. This coming year, it'll be in San Jose. So again, it's an educational opportunity, networking opportunity. We have experts from fields that matter to us that come and speak. Uh, your keynote speeches, master talks, also breakout sessions that really uh, let our participants engage uh, on a smaller level to really talk about specific case studies. We talk about issues um, that I'm sure you all talk about, homelessness, parking, access, transportation, economic development, uh, things of that nature. Um, our conference attendance has been growing um, as our organization has grown. We had about 180 participants at our last conference, um, and we're looking forward to our next one in San Jose. Uh, lastly, we have two primary revenue streams. We get revenue from uh, our annual membership dues, which always are a percentage of uh, budget from the organizations that uh, are, are our members, and then also through registration from folks who attend our conferences. Um, and that's CDA in a nutshell. Uh, we thank South Park for uh, its membership and uh, continued support and partnership in our organization. So we all met Kathleen Ross. Oh, yeah, she's that. terrific. So is she on your board? Is that what I heard? She, uh, she is not. She is on the IDA board. I think she's okay. actually going to be there this year. Okay. Yeah, I, I know Kathleen well. I worked for her. Yeah, so I'm going to do a kind of a mafia or something. <laughs> <laughs> we try. I think Los Angeles <laughs> has a great deal of. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I think Los Angeles has a lot of. Influence. There's, uh, we have really great members here who understand uh, state legislation and, and policy. I think it's been uh, helpful for us to advocate on our behalf. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Mm -hmm. All right, next up, we have BizFed. So Mitchell here is here um, to speak about the efforts of the LA County Business Federation. Now, well, this is a long, I don't know if I have one for everyone, but maybe every other person. And great. Going along, hi everyone, Mitchell Vieira with BizFed, the Los Angeles County Business Federation. Um, BizFed is a association of associations. So our members 
are chambers of commerce, business improvement districts, trade associations, ethnic and minority women business groups. Uh, the Los Angeles Area Chamber is a member of BizFed. The Central City Association is a member of BizFed. Uh, and so we're constantly working every day to grow a larger community and coalition of business groups so that we have that power in numbers that really works well for a massive grassroots mobilization. Um, the, in the brochure here, it has some information on some of the work that we've done in the past. Uh, we do have a number of committees that you can get involved in, including a labor and employment and small business committee, a land use uh, and housing and real estate committee, water, energy and environment, transportation, a number of uh, different sectors and areas. And the way that you can become involved with them is by becoming a member of this fed. So in the back of the brochure, there's a pamphlet, and it has an orange top to the top of the start of it. And if you open that up, it actually has a list of all of our current members. And so you can see kind of the wide array and variety of different types of members that we have. Um, and in the inside of it, you'll find some information on how to become a member. So there's a uh, basic membership and an elite membership. Both get you similar um, access to the organization uh, with the elite membership just getting you better placement on our materials and in the work that we do. And the reason I bring up membership is I want to highlight the three areas where you get your benefit and value. The first is we do information sharing. So we're constantly sending out uh, action alerts and info alerts on everything that we work on every day when we are progressing on an issue, when we're coming up with um, mobilization that we need help from our member organizations on. Uh, and so um, that is the first part of being a member is you get the information and intel sharing. The second part is being able to participate in any of the committees that you like. Up to five people from the organization can participate as a committee member and have the vote on the committee. Um, up to five people can participate on our board of directors with a single vote from the bid as a board member. So everyone is a board member, it's an equal playing field across the board. Um, and then the last thing, and this is the way that we're somewhat unique, is all of our issues come from our membership and only our membership. And the way that we um, develop our issues is you would bring something as a South Park bid that's of interest to you. We would put that through our committee process, through our board of directors process. If it passes through, then our staff would run on it and work on it and try to make an outcome for the positive, uh, positive outcome for you. So that is an interesting um, format or structure of the way that we do things and how you can get really a bang for your buck with us is by being able to um, uh, get your issues forward and put them out there. So the transportation project we were talking about a second ago, that could be something that you bring to our transportation committee, it goes to our advocacy committee and our board of directors, and then all of a sudden you have the BizFed machine, not only staff, but all 180 different business associations working on that together to try to create some sort of substantive change. Um, and so those are the three big areas that um, we work on uh, to provide benefit to our membership. Uh, in the brochure, you'll find some more information on who our officers are uh, and a number of uh, things about our membership and some of the work that we've done in the past uh, couple of years uh, in different subject areas. We worked heavily on Measure H and HHH. Um, we've worked uh, a lot in different sectors of homelessness. We spoke up on Mitchell v. Los Angeles, which was a case that I'm sure many of you guys were tracking very closely. Uh, and so we're constantly trying to make sure that we're paying attention to um, what's happening in our downtown corridors. Um, and the last thing that I'll say is if you have any questions, please let me know. Any questions from anyone? No? Okay. Thank you very much. Just so the board uh, knows, the bid is not a current member of Ms. Fed, but they are very active. When you said you spoke up on the Mitchell case, what was your position? So we took a similar position to CCA and um, saying we didn't want there to be a settlement. And, um, and that's 
the most that I know. <laughs> but I can get my team to find out more information. Oh, sure. That. Yeah, absolutely. Other questions? And I think that is a prime example of the type of thing that we can work on is the, um, the doing the underground uh, metro station for the um, transportation project. That's something that our transportation uh, guru on staff to our right would take to this committee and could really push forward to be an action item for our advocacy committee and for our board of directors and um, really provide one more voice in the mixture of everything. And it's just not one voice, it's one voice times 180 because we have 180 different associations that are members. Well, thanks for your consideration. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and last but not least, we have uh, Michael Shulstone from Central City Association to share the views on the work of SCCA. Hi, everybody. Uh, so I'm Seth Michael Shulstone. I'm the director of Economic Development for the Central City Association. Uh, we represent about 400 members from business, nonprofits, and trade organizations. And actually, we have three more members. Uh, so thanks for your support. You guys, those of you who are members, probably have a longer tenure with CCA than I do. and want to know more about CCA. Um, so I just passed around uh, our 2018 policy accomplishments. We do this annual, kind of sort of annual summary of what we've done in the past year. I think it's just a good reference point uh, to get a lot of all the individual policy issues and projects that we've involved in, and uh, provide a good overview of our advocacy. Um, our overarching uh, organizing principle and advocacy priority is to provide a vision for the future of downtown Los Angeles. Um, and within that sort of larger overarching goal, we have five uh, advocacy priorities or advocacy areas, um, which you'll see on that sheet. Uh, so first, making downtown a good place for housing development at all income levels, uh, advancing comprehensive solutions to homelessness, expanding mobility options in downtown LA, uh, supporting and attracting and maintaining uh, businesses in downtown LA, and enhancing the experience of downtown for uh, visitors, workers, and residents. Um, we are, I'm sure you know, a downtown LA, a greater downtown LA focus advocacy organization. So most of our issues are specific to downtown, but we do get involved in citywide policy issues uh, as well as statewide policy issues. Um, and in terms of our advocacy approach, uh, it's similar to the Chamber of Commerce, where it has, they have their policy councils, we have policy committees that roughly fall in line with these different areas and meet uh, just about weekly, uh, say for a few months. We also have our once a month uh, executive committee meeting, uh, again, just about once a month, but uh, where we have, we'll bring in a speaker, a business leader, or a, an elected official, um, or a city department head. Uh, provide an overview of their work as well as to provide face-to-face -face engagement with a number of our members. Um, and in addition to those sort of uh, formal committees and larger events that we put on uh, around topic-specific issues, um, we also do a number of sort of as necessary, as relevant, uh, and as timely uh, advocacy forming working groups with our members uh, to engage with the relevant city departments and relevant officials. Uh, uh, and yeah, really just serving as a bridge between the private and public sector. I'm happy to take questions. Great. I think most of our board members are very familiar with the CCA, uh, but I'd love for you all to consider plugging in directly um, if you have the time. I know time is always uh, an issue. But just to give yourselves a sense of how they work. Um, you are always welcome to attend any of their um, committee meetings or even executive committee meetings. Um, I can extend that invitation to you. Yes. Okay, Michael, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, so last but not least, um, I'm really excited to hear from Dave Gordon. Dave is overseeing the project, um, the Eden project. Uh, this is at 1340 South Hill. Um, he will be sharing where, where they're at in the events. So Dave, take it away. Oh, thanks so much. And thanks so much for having me. I think uh, most of you know me, but for those that don't, my name is Dave Gordon. 
Uh, born and raised in LA, spent about 10 years working out in New York, where I became a uh, full-blown urbanist and moved back to LA about three years ago. My family has held a property in South Park for about 65 years. My grandfather bought it in the mid-1960s. Uh, so I remember growing up, going to South Park, and it was just a sea of parking lots, small one and two story, commercial structures, light industrial. So uh, about four years ago, we made the decision, as we, as we saw the action really moving down to Olympic and finally down to Pico, to pursue entitlements for our land. It's about an acre and a quarter, 54,000 square feet. And you can see on this map where it's located, 14th Hill Street, uh, bordered by Hill and Broadway, and then 14th Street and 14th Place. So about a block south of Pico, uh, really on the frontier of where the action has been. Uh, so, as I was mentioning, I, I spent a lot of time in New York, and you know, while there's a lot that we don't want to emulate about New York, there are certain things that um, I feel strongly about. Some of those things are walkability, uh, pedestrian activation in the areas around our community, um, really building up the retail and restaurant spaces so that we can have you know, more eyeballs, more bodies in those areas, which really help to uh, promote safety and security, protect more people around. And especially the infrastructure items that Helen and the team here such strong advocates for. Um, and Helen, I want to thank you and I want to thank Josh for all of your help and support and, and guidance for this whole process. Uh, so it, as you can see, everything in red is an apartment um, or a condo project, most of which are very new. So the Pico Corridor, you know, in the last two years, we've seen almost 2,000 new residents coming in, uh, just between the six projects over there. And really, between our project and the Emerald, which Jade Enterprises is uh, breaking ground pretty soon, we uh, you know, are hoping to keep propelling that frontier and then moving south toward the tent. Uh, there are two primary ways that mid rises get entitled. The first is T bar, which is really the primary option that most go for, and that's essentially paying for the additional building uh, square footage. We decided to go with a greater downtown housing incentive which allows for a 35% increase in the buildable square footage in exchange for providing affordable units. So we're providing 5% for very low income, which is 12 units, and 20% for workforce, which is an additional 47 units. So 25% will be income restricted. The other 75% will be market rate. And really, as I think through kind of the brand and how my family wants this community to feel you know, within the building, really viewing it as a melting pot of a diverse set of backgrounds, colors, and income thresholds. Um, and so kind of with that in mind, plus kind of going for an escapism field, we decided to go with the name The Eden, and that's what we're in the project. Uh, as soon as you walk in, you're supposed to feel like you're outside of the concrete jungle, you're no longer you know, close to work, you feel you know, very, it's a very lush environment. Um, so we also, in addition to the 235 units that we got entitled, um, we're going to have about 9,000 square feet of ground floor retail uh, and restaurant space uh, bordering the property. We received our entitlements in late 2017, and uh, so it's been quite a bit of time since then. And kind of the overall for the project is, as I mentioned, 235 apartment units, 87 units will be studios, which is about 40%. The other, another 40% will be one bedrooms, and 20% for uh, two bedrooms. Relatively efficient sizes, um, you know, about on par with the other supply that's along Pico. This is the uh, the view looking down from the Ren. Uh, so if you were walking down Hill Street, this is this is what you would see uh, on the ground floor. One out a couple things. So on the ground floor, this space is about 5,000 square feet for restaurant um, or retail. Uh, or it could be a couple of restaurant days we have uh, domain all on the way. It's a 18 foot wide sidewalk along Hill Street and Broadway. And we're going to be adding bunk baths, which add roughly up to 10 feet as well. Uh, and then we're going to be doing a parklet right outside the restaurant. And so that so planning has been very supportive behind the bunk baths and the parklet, uh, which I was a little bit surprised by. That, you know, typically everything is right by uh, the guidelines. There's four of this. Um, so you can see we've got 
a pool deck along Hill Street, which will get a big red right afternoon sun. There's a double height club room with fitness right behind that and a roof deck up top. And then this is a couple other views. This is the top left is looking uh, kind of over our neighbor, Mira, on 14th Place in Broadway, on uh, the back side of the building. And then the bottom right is looking on Broadway and 14th Street. Um, so what we have here, and I'll take you through the, uh, the floor plan in a second. We've got a secondary lobby on 14th Street, which is really going to be the primary move and move out lobby so we can get the, you know, the, the heavy trucks off of the two main arteries. Uh, and then we've got a pretty large dog run. It's at about 700 square feet, covered but not totally enclosed. It's going to be open to Broadway with fencing, a lot of ventilation. Uh, so when our residents are leaving or, or coming back on the walk with their dogs, they'll stop in here, they can do their business, get fully irrigated uh, and, and ventilated, and then take a stroll down Broadway. Uh, we're hopeful that that'll help with some of the issues that seen elsewhere. So this is a plan of the first floor, the ground floor. You can see the top left is Hill and 14th Place. Um, just on the north side of us is a, an active oil operation, the last one in downtown. Um, and so we have parking access along Hill Street and 14th Place. So um, if you're coming in as a retail or uh, a guest of a resident, you can do a full loop around, so full circulation, so you don't have to stop and do an awkward three-point turn and come back out. And then we're going to have secure gates both here and here for residents, whether they're going down to the single subterranean level that we're having for parking, or upstairs we're having some additional parking for minor units. Uh, the lob, primary lobby is going to be on Hill Street with a a secondary retail or restaurant location here, kind of envisioning a coffee shop deal. And then an additional retail space on the Broadway and 14th Street side. With the dog room that I mentioned, this is the secondary lobby that's going to be the primary movement to move out uh, access for the residents. And then kind of some of the back of house, transform electric room, and fire pump room. The second floor was designed so that if and hopefully when, LA City decides to reduce parking minimums, we can convert the parking up here to another use, like a creative office or additional retail. Um, we, we gave 13 and a half foot high ceilings here so that we can create a real office environment if, uh, if this does come to fruition. And we've wrapped 14th Street on the south side and Broadway with minor units with a really cool business lounge up here. It's got an outdoor deck component so that if you are working, you can be around Broadway looking down the street. Uh, rapid windows. This is the third floor, so on top of the concrete podium. It's going to be two levels of concrete, five levels of wood wrap above that. We have the bulk of the amenities on this level. So this is where the pool deck is along the street on the left side. And we're calling this the garden to be the primary courtyard. Uh, it's going to be very lush, a lot of landscape in there. Uh, and then on the bottom left that you see here, this is the primary club room. It's going to be double height, so about 19 feet tall. And the gym right here, which has a portion that with a, a mezzanine level, so part of it's going to be double height, part of it uh, with mezzanine, and then a yoga room right above that. And here's a couple of views of the pool deck. So on the top left, uh, it's looking back at the double height club room. The top right is a kind of overhead plan. The bottom right is looking as you walk out of the yoga studio toward the pool. So this is looking toward Hill Street. And then this is looking from the club room out toward the rest of the building. You have this fireplace uh, with a 40 door, so as you walk out from the club room, you can see through the fireplace to the pool deck. And then this page is looking at the Garden of Eden courtyard. So we're looking at doing a, a large family style dining table um, covered surrounded by olive trees and covered with twinkling lights that create a really tranquil experience. And then we're going to have a couple of Korean barbecue dining tables, which have become pretty popular in the area. Uh, and a couple of kind of gazebos and water features as well. Uh, floors four to six are generally just residential. And then the seventh floor, we have an indoor lounge. 
And the views from here really are looking straight toward the core of downtown. So you have a great skyline view, uh, really incredible views, and then the outdoor deck on the, the left side. So this is a view of the outdoor wood deck. Um, this is as you kind of exit from the building looking toward the pool. Uh, we below you, obviously. This is overlooking Hill Street, so we'll have a couple swinging chairs to, to look at the Jake's building. And then looking back at the you know, couple big TVs, fireplace, uh, you know, just a place to relax outside the cupboard. Um, so right now we're in for building permits. We submitted in March. Uh, hoping to get those back later this fall and hopefully to break ground you know, early first quarter of 2020. It's going to be about a two year construction period. Yes? So is there an apple tree in the garden? That's what we're talking about right now. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Men's room is that a woman's room? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a great presentation. Yeah. Yeah. I applaud you for actually listening at the meetings that you've come to. For what you said about <laughs> access to parking and unloading and dog runs. And yeah. It sounds like you've really listened to the issues of other buildings and taken it in on yours. Looks great. Yeah, that's right. And uh, the, the trash is off the main board. Yeah, so. you've you really listened. You've done a great job. Have you all? Performa events when there's so many units coming on. Do you try to position differently or just build to so, a standard and hope that it, you can get paid off the market? Because this is very high energy. Yeah, it is. So, you know, our strategy going in was we're providing units that are slightly smaller, about five percent smaller than market <coughs> ego. So, so we can provide you know, a little bit tighter units and bring down rents. The same way. Uh, so you're all in costs on a monthly basis if you spend probably you know, $100 less than a comparable unit that might be a little bit bigger. Uh, so that, that was our strategy on that side. But really, I mean, if you look at the market along the Pico border, I think Dan can certainly speak this better than I. Uh, every building we sell in 12 months, and the rents have been amazing. So I don't think there's, I certainly don't have any concerns on the demand side. Uh, and there is going to be a couple year gap between when a lot of the new supply that's under construction right now is finishing and when we finish construction when we're complete. Uh, so hopefully in that time period everything will have passed up, will become stabilized, and we'll, uh, we pan emerald to the uh, two new projects on the market at that point. And then you have a long term as well? Yes, very much so. What are some of the comparable rents going for right now? You know, at the rent, there are, you know, the small studios are going for about $2,000 a month. Uh, the two bedrooms are going for upwards of $4,000, $3,500 and $4,000. What's that square foot? Uh, I think it's $4. Okay. The, uh, the high rise are going to be closer to six right now. The upper floor is the high rise. I mean, even the upper floor is the high rise. Five and a half to six. And they've been leasing quickly, too.
The, on the other side is our um, butterfly service, and that's for wheelchair accessible and um, any even temporary disability. So if you're having knee surgery, if you're having any kind of impairment, even for a little while, please call. $2. Um, What's your definition of downtown LA? Uh, that's a very good question. It's any space within the four freeways. So it's a okay. So it's even across the river in Boyle Heights to Pico Gardens. Even as far south as USC? Uh, not as far south as USC. I'm sorry to say that. We tried. Um, <laughs> you know, but to, to stay at $2 a ride. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but we do go across the freeway to get to Union Station. So if you have people who are saying, look, I just don't want the hassle of having to take three trains um, or a bus, um, let us know. And again, I am here as a resource. I want to thank um, Ellen. She is our board member. And um, I just want to thank her for being just a stalwart board member and partner because these are projects that, in order to keep the costs low, our marketing budget is practically non existent. So that's why you have me here in person. Um, but, I will, but I will go anywhere and do anything. If you have events, if you need um, people at booths, I am your person. Believe me, this is fun for me and it is a joy and it really is a resource that so many people are using as a lifeline, not just a lifestyle. So um, let me know if there's anything more I can give you. And again, thank you, Ellen, for being such a great partner. Thank, thank you. you for coming. Thank yeah. you for How long did you say prospect of the way is? It's, usually it's about 10 minutes. And actually, um, it's less because our headquarters for our um, for our vehicles are actually at the TCW building, which is at night and wow. fig. So we tend so ten minutes is the average if you're say in the arts district, but around here it's like three. It's and nice. and I'll tell you this, we're honest about our wait time. So we don't <laughs> say it'll be three minutes and then it's fifteen. It's like well if we say it's ten, it'll be ten. And I will show you if you want to reach out to me, I will show you a way to pre-book trips. Um, there's a really sneaky way that Okay. We can only support from <laughs> No, just an honest testimonial. The service is terrific. On the wait times, yeah. you might go on here and it might say 10 minutes, but they will show up in like three. Where you can go on Uber or Lyft and it'll say three minutes. And then when you hit the button, suddenly it's seven. So it really is about the same wait time as Uber or Lyft. And they are terrific. Thank you. And so for, uh, for some of our employees, uh, it's oh, low income fares are free, and here's the cool thing about the low income fares because our goal is to have everybody ride with dignity. Um, we, we do this like an airplane where no one knows how much you pay for your ticket. So, what we do is you call in and you tell us, um, you know, what qualifies you as low income, and it's, and it's over the phone. So, we are not here for retinal scans, we're not here for <laughs> anything, right? We just want to help you. So what we do is um, you call us and within a half an hour we give you a promo code. That promo code is good for $60 worth of rides. And all you do is you, you just book your fare like anybody else when you just use that promo code. So it costs you nothing, you get 30 rides, and then when that 30 rides expires, you get a new promo code. So everybody gets on, you know, you don't have to you know claim anything else, you just get on and you ride. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, Thank you for your time. Thank you for your time. Yeah. All right, so before we adjourn.